invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 52. This is something of a little trailer sermon to follow up on the series from Isaiah 53, 54, and 55. Kind of a culminating uh, message from all those passages. In Isaiah 52, we read about the proclamation of good news because people are being delivered out of bondage and brought into the promised land. It's a vertical movement from bondage in Babylon across the world to the promised land to be restored. Good news after suffering under God's curse. So this very horizontal movement, not vertical, but horizontal movement is anticipatory of the proclamation of the gospel, which is good news of deliverance from this fallen evil age vertically into the age to come by faith in Christ. So we need to understand that the old covenant anticipates the new. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. There shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You are sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now, therefore, what have I here? What have I here? declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wait, de- wail, declares the Lord, and continually, all the day, my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go out in flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Now, if you would turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which will actually be the text the message this morning. Again, the fulfillment of good news. Good news not just nationally, but spiritually. We're reading verses 1 through 14. I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive 
though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are glorious words. These are words of good news. These are words of what you have done in Christ for us in our salvation. Oh, may they come to us afresh. May they come to us again. And may we find ourselves standing, standing firm in this proclamation, in your word, in your deed, in Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, when you get up in the morning and you want to make yourself something kind of warm, something kind of crunchy, something carbohydrate-like, something made out of grain, you get up in the morning and you want to make yourself some toast, you need a toaster. And if you take that bread and you take that toaster and you drop the bread into the toaster, you will then have toast. So bread plus toaster equal toast. It's kind of simple. But if you're going to benefit from that toast, you can't just leave it on the counter or leave it in the toaster, right? You have to pick up the toast and eat it. And then you'll have the benefit of it. Now, crackers are not toast. They're crackers. And there's a lot of crackers that are being pawned off as if it's toast. And it's not toast. There's a lot of things that are pawned off as gospel, even called gospel, even called preaching the gospel, that is neither gospel nor preaching gospel. It might be psychology. It might be religion. It might be hints for better living. It might be liturgy. It might be a lot of things that in and of themselves are good. Beneficial in their own right. But it's not gospel. Gospel is gospel. That's right. <laughs> so this morning we want to look at two things. We want to look at what toast is. Gospel. What is it? And then we want to look at the fact that it must be eaten. If you're to benefit by it. Just hearing the gospel will not benefit you if you do not receive it and believe it and ingest it. And if you don't, this is what Paul says here, is receiving it in vain, without benefit. So first of all, the gospel is a word preached. It is a word that is preached. That's gospel. It's called good news. That's what the word means. Good news. And, of course, good news is good news because of bad news. You know, if the doctor comes to you and says, I can do heart plant transplants, and you don't need one, well, you get to clap for the doctor, but it's not good news for you. You know, you just stand in awe. Wow, that's, 
Amazing, you can do that. But if you're gasping for breath, when your heart's pounding away at 180 beats per minute, ready to jump out of your chest, and the world's starting to fade away from vision, and, and right before you uh, pass out, a man in a white coat comes and says, I'm the number one heart physician in the country today. You, you pass out with great hope, with great good news ringing in your ear. Right? The gospel is a word preached. In Romans chapter 10, it tells us that Jesus Christ himself is personally present in the preaching of his word. That's Romans 10. And that faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That's Christ's word. Would you like to hear from Jesus? Then go where the gospel is preached by a man who's called to preach it. That's what Paul says. He says they have to be sent. There is a, a calling to a man's preaching. And it's to be recognized not just by him. When I was in college, we used to take turns preaching. And one Sunday we got together, there was a new guy there. We didn't know who he was, and all of a sudden he stood up. And he started doing this thing that he called preaching. And to all of us, whatever it was, it wasn't preaching. And a bunch of us sitting there with our eyes wide open, wondering what to do. And thankfully, one of the elders got up and took him by the arm gently and walked him off to the side. That was the done, the end of his sermon. He was not called to preach, whatever that was. But brothers and sisters, there are men that have been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to listen because Christ is employing them to speak to us and benefit us because in hearing and embracing that preached word, Paul says, faith is ignited within us to the salvation of our souls, to our union with Jesus Christ. This is the word, a word rooted first in the Old Testament. Paul says that Christ died according to the Scriptures. He rose according to the Scriptures. Paul's talking about the Old Testament Scriptures, that the Old Testament Scriptures are focused and anticipate and look forward to the death and resurrection of the Messiah. That's the, that's the Old Testament Scriptures and words. It anticipates Christ. And the New Testament word explicates Christ. Anticipates Old Testament. Explicates New Testament. Now you might say, well, what's explicate? Well, I had to look it up. But it means to take that which is obscure and explain it, interpret it, expound upon it. The Old Testament word looks to the New Testament deed in Christ and that New Testament word looks back and expounds and explains it for our lucidity and illumination and belief. And Christ is therein preached to the lips of a preacher from Old and New Testament scriptures. And we should never believe the words of a man regardless of how animated he is or how good-looking he is or how learned he's supposed to be, we should always take his word and look at Scripture. Does it match? And when you do that, you know what happens to you? You become convinced. You become comforted by good news. Brothers and sisters, each and every one of you will either stand or fall on the basis of how you listen to Scripture. How you listen to that word preached by God's ordained servant. 
Well, the gospel, as a word preached, is a gospel about something. And that's one of the touchstones with regard to claims, the gospel. All right. You claim to be preaching the gospel. What do you have to say? What's the content of the message that you bring? The gospel has a very, very clear, distinctive content. And you can know that content without ever going to any theological, scriptural, higher education. You can know you can be five years old and you can know the content of the gospel. It's for everybody. It's for us all. And Paul gives it to us right here. The gospel is a message of Christ's humiliation and exaltation. Elsewhere, the Bible says it's, it's the sufferings and glory of Christ. The sufferings and glory of Christ. That's the message of the scripture. That is the message of the gospel. That first of all, Christ came, the Son of God incarnate. God and man, two natures and one person forever, came for us. Came to redeem us. He came to die for our sins. According to the scriptures. Well, if Jesus Christ came to die for our sins, then we have, that's the, that's the bad news. That's the, that's the backdrop. That's the backdrop of, the, I got a serious heart problem. I need some serious, well-trained heart surgery. Or it's going to be over for me. And that's the bad news. And that's the backdrop. When Isaiah, Isaiah 52 says, you know, how beautiful are the feet of those who coming down from the mountains proclaim good news. Oh, what was the bad news? The bad news is Israel had been driven out of the promised land, divorced by God and being breakers of his covenant, and were laboring under the curse in Babylon, drying up away from God and his fellowship. And now the good news is what? Come on back now. The curse is dealt with. Come on back. Be comforted. And that's the gospel, that Christ has died for our sins. If you watch the R.C. Sproul video today in the Sunday school class, you learned about expiation. Christ takes away our sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said of Jesus in his death for us. He takes away the guilt of our sin but he takes away the guilt of our sin, expiation, by bearing the wrath of God for our sin, propitiation. Christ died for our sins. Our sins, identifiably by the law of God, call for our cursing, call for our exile, call for our banishment from the presence of God forever. But the gospel, the good news, saying that your sins have been dealt with through expiation of Christ and the cross, through propitiation of Christ and the cross, so you can be reconciled to God. Come on back. Good news. Come back. Because of the suffering of Jesus Christ culminating in his cross has been finished. And thus sin, deep, dark, repetitive sin that holds us in bondage, can be forgiven. And this bondage broken by the power of Christ's cross. Well, Christ's cross is not only stands as a reminder and as a proclamation to us of Christ's passive obedience, but Christ's cross also stands before us equally as a proclamation that on the cross Christ finished a lifetime of obedience to God in this world, in his humiliation, in his flesh. The cross tells us that Christ's obedience finished flawlessly. And that means there's a perfect righteousness, a perfect cleansing of our filth, 
and a perfect righteousness to be worn by faith in Jesus Christ. Our sin, our lack of righteousness, resolved in the cross of Christ. And this same Christ who died for sins, according to the scriptures, Paul says he was buried. Now Christ was buried for a reason. It wasn't just because he was dead, and that's what we do with dead people. But burial is a sign and seal. Burial is a sign and seal that death has occurred. So that Christ's death is signed and sealed in his burial. He's dead. So that when God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, quickens and translates the dead Lord Jesus Christ, he is raised powerfully and no tomb could possibly hold him. Jesus Christ is translated in the moment of resurrection. In the moment when his body is translated by the Spirit from a, from a body of humiliation and weakness of flesh to a body that Paul says is a body that is heavenly and spiritual. In that moment, he transitions from humiliation to exaltation. He transitions from suffering to glory. That's gospel. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to having a different body someday. Anything wrong with your body? You little kids are sitting there. I can hardly sit still. I am so alive, man. (laughs) Just wait. (laughs) I was where you were once. (laughs) And now my body hurts every day. It's getting old. It's breaking down. It's wearing out. And they do. And they will. And that's why Christ's resurrection body is good news. Why? Because he doesn't have to die again? No, because Jesus says, he who believes in me will never die. (laughs) You will live with a resurrection body animated by the spirit that animated his. And that transaction from the old to the new seen in Jesus Christ is received now by faith in the gospel proclamation. That's right. Newness of life can begin now in your heart. That resurrection body can begin now inside of you in a resurrection soul, animated, already ahead of time. A down payment, Paul says, of the body to come. That's good news. And this this Christ, this Christ of suffering and of glory, This Christ who died, who was buried, who rose, this Christ comes to you through preaching. He speaks to you through preaching. This Christ comes and says the transition, the translation, I have undergone, I have come to share with you today. Believe in me, trust in me. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll be clothed in my righteousness. And you'll be raised from your spiritual tombs and animated with my life to be culminated when I return in power and glory. And your body will match your soul. Is that good news? It's good news if you know you're a sinner that's decaying and falling apart and there's no way out and you're headed for a day 
that is a day of a close inspection that you cannot endure. That's good news. And the Apostle Paul says here that the gospel I preach to you, the word I preach to you, is a word where he says in verse 11, we preached and so you believed. And if you don't believe, you have heard and you've received it into your ear in vain. It never accomplished its end purpose in you. But the gospel... The gospel is a message about Christ's own humiliation and exaltation, about his own change from this world to the world to come. And it's a message that calls us to come in and share in it by faith in Jesus Christ. And when we do, when we are placed in Christ by faith, all things change. Paul says, if you are a new creature in Jesus Christ, the old have passed away, the new has come. In other words, the gospel indicative of what Christ has accomplished and what you trust in will begin bearing its fruit in your life. That law, which became a dreadful Reminder of my sin and curse, that very same law now becomes a guide and pathway through which I give thanks to God for the good news I have in Jesus Christ. It's how I say thank you to him by hearing that Ten Commandments, by hearing his ethical portrait of a true human being in Scripture and seek to run in it. Because I've been raised from my spiritual tomb. I've been set free from the curse. And that means as I seek to walk in the light of God's word and law, there's no more dread. That old dread of, oh, if I blow it, it's over. If I blow it, the relationship's tanked. If I blow it, I'm I'm going back to the hell I've been delivered from. No, no. It means that the forgiveness that has been given to you initially is a forgiveness that will buoy you up throughout your life. God will treat you from beginning to end as a dear, stumbling child that you are in him as a father who considers your frame that it is but dust and fallen dust at that, but dust that nonetheless is under the redeeming, transforming influence and power of the gospel. The gospel bears its fruit in our life. See, the gospel guarantees heaven. The gospel says if you trust in Jesus Christ, not only are you forgiven and clothed in righteousness, but you are guaranteed heaven, eternal life. But see, the wonderful thing is the gospel not only guarantees heaven, it imparts heaven. One of my favorite professors in seminary used to get critiqued for always being too focused on pie in the sky, by and by. One of the students told him about that. You know, a lot of people think you're just too much pie in the sky, by and by. And my old professor heard that. He, he looked at him. He goes, he goes, give me more of that pie. Give me more of that pie. Brothers and sisters, the gospel not only calls us to heaven, but imparts to us ahead of time a fellowship with heaven in this world. And thus it propels us, you see, into a different life. The life of heaven begins to exert itself in our lives as reconciled people of God. Well, you might say, okay, that's great. It's done, it's over, I Hear the gospel, I believe it, and I'm going to go forth and walk in it. Thank you. One little caveat here. For those who believe that preaching is how Christ speaks to you and imparts himself to you. You ever see the movie, 51st Dates? 
It's about a lady who had amnesia, and her memory could only last until she fell asleep. So she'd get up in the morning, no memory. Then she'd acquire memories throughout the day. At the end of the day, she'd fall asleep, wake up in the morning, no memory. Right? Didn't know who she was married to, who she had relationships with, didn't know she had kids. Right? So every morning, they got up, they had a, a VCH for her, she plugged it in, told her who she was, where she was born, about her life, about her kids, about her marriage, blah, 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 and she got updated. She was able to remember. She got refreshed. And isn't that a picture of us, poor spiritual memories? It is. We need to be reminded. We need to be re-infused with the gospel on a regular basis. Because we forget. And we need to hear it again every week. And when we hear that gospel, our memories become ignited and refreshed and we get refocused. And we get drawn into Christ to love him evermore and to grow in the richness of his grace. It's the audible word. And as we come to worship, to hear that word, it tells us in Matthew 28 when they came to Jesus in the mountain that they worshiped, but what? But some what? They doubted. You wonder, boy, that just ruined it. <laughs> Why don't you just come out and worship him and go from there? Why do you have to? And some doubted. <laughs> it's because that's us. We need to keep returning to hear of Christ and allow that word to attack and gobble up that doubt that keeps reasserting itself, that, that for spiritual forgetfulness. And the audible word then is accompanied with an edible word. It said some people learn more by doing rather than hearing. Well, here's an opportunity for you to have some doing involved in your hearing that brings home to you the very thing you heard. You get to handle it and taste it and together do it. You do one thing. Do this in remembrance of me. Allow yourself to be reacquainted and reinvigorated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this gospel tells us and assures us for this journey we are on to the celestial city that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. And though dead and dull as I may feel that I may be week by week, Christ rose again according to the scriptures to bring us comfort to bring us the real deal. This is the real toast. This is what will nourish and feed your souls. The gospel. But you must eat it. You must partake of it. To receive its benefits. To be comforted by it. Transformed by it and invigorated with its life and its hope. Let us pray.